welcome back to the Prince Cast. I'm Michael Medeiros, and joining me today are two seniors, um, Jeffrey Mensch and Yuel Bitran. Um, we're here today, as you can probably guess, to talk about the Hummus referendum and the debate that has caused on campus and well beyond campus in the national media. Yoel and others have proposed a referendum that Princeton should provide multiple options in hummus um, because of the controversy surrounding the company that makes the hummus that sold in most campus stores. And Jeffrey wrote a column sort of related to the issue and going beyond it a little bit. Um, so Jeffrey, why don't you summarize those points and we'll go from there. I wrote a column earlier this week uh, describing basically three different ways in which people interpret the term pro-Israel. The first way is basically taken by some people that you should defend all of Israel's actions if you want to consider yourself pro-Israel. The second one is that you defend Israel's right to exist. Now, I don't think that's a very reasonable description either because I don't think that anybody denies the right of Iraq or Iran to exist. So the last um, definition, which I think is actually the most commonly used one, and I think is the most reasonable one, is that to be pro-Israel means that you should view Israel as a friend and an ally. And this doesn't preclude is recognizing that Israel does certain things that are objectionable. But it nevertheless says, despite those things, we should still view Israel as our friend. I think that it's important that we support Israel because Israel is the only free country in the Middle East and North Africa, and Israel is under threat for its existence as recognized not just by Israel, not just by the United States, but by countries like France who have said that we have to recognize that we are behind Israel under threat from countries like Iran. Yeah, well, so well, how do you feel about this framework of seeing Israel as an ally versus the other categories? And I don't know, under this framework, would you consider yourself pro-Israel? Um, I actually would consider myself pro-Israel. Yeah. I think the main difference between uh, what PCP is doing, for example, or my approach, and the approach that uh, Jeffrey would have, um, and a lot of the people who have come against the referendum, for example, would have, is that I think that it's not enough to just say, well, we are against settlement construction, period. Starting a discussion about these issues, informing people about Israel's human rights violations, is we do that precisely because we think that the only way that Israel can be assured of a secure and peaceful future is not only if we just, you know, we, like, we, we recognize that Israel is, is doing uh, self-destructive, uh, uh, counterproductive things and we just say it out loud and don't do anything about it, but that we actually have to take action. We actually have to do uh, what we did, uh, uh, what, what students uh, and activists all around the country, all around the world did during uh, apartheid in South Africa, which was not only to recognize, okay, these policies are wrong, these policies are destructive to South Africans, uh, uh, to, the, to, to uh, democracy in South Africa, but to actually uh, exert international pressure to force South Africans to, to do introspection. And so I think that, and I think uh, Jeffrey uh, made reference to Tom Friedman's um, uh, article, where Tom Friedman basically said the same thing. He says, what we need to do is start, uh, do constructive criticism of Israel. That doesn't work. We've been doing constructive criticism of Israel for decades now. Today, a couple of hour, hours ago, what we just saw is that Israel uh, released information that they're constructing more than 200 settlements in East Jerusalem. So the policy of just uh, uh, constructive criticism, talking nicely to the Israelis, and just saying, listen, we're concerned about what you're doing, it's just, it doesn't have any effect. Uh, that's not, I think, if you think that settlement construction, if you think that abusing human rights violations is bad for Israel, which I think, you, which I think a lot of people like Jeffrey are well-intentioned, well and they do think that, then you have to do something about it. You can't just say it. And, and the way we've decided to do something about it is by, uh, uh, you know, uh, allowing us to to not, you know, to start a discussion on campus about these things and to try to send a message to Israelis. This is one of the things that the referendum was supposed to do, and this initiative in general is supposed to do, is to send a message to Israelis that, you know, as Americans, as Princeton students, uh, as people who are pro-Israel, we are concerned about what you're doing, we're concerned about the occupation of, 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 of Palestinian territories, we are concerned about your violations of human rights, and we demand that you stop. And not only because it's wrong, not only because it's like an international, against international law, but because it's, you're destroying your own future. No, I, I, I can see that point, but Jeffrey, uh, as someone who said you know, that you have mixed feelings about settlement construction, what track would you take to wean Israel off of that? So, um, earlier this year, um, there was a big issue, also going back to last year, um, Obama put pressure on the Israeli government to freeze settlements, settlements, new settlement construction. So what in practice was the pressure? So in, I don't know the details, but um, they were pretty adamant in their uh, insistence on that, and Israel caved into that pressure. Um, I think I don't have any problem with the American government pressuring the Israeli government to cease settlement construction. 
Um, I just think that when you apply the methods that you believe apply to uh, apartheid South Africa, the situations really are not analogous. And when you apply, that's the first point. And the second point is, when you apply a boycott, having lived in Israel for about a year, I'm pretty familiar with the way Israelis view these things, and they just view boycotts as a continuation of Arab, um, the Arab boycott from 1948, which was aimed to delegitimize Israel. And in order to distinguish that, you have to come across with constructive criticism. Well, is, is there something in between? Or do you think As I said, I think that there's, I have no problem with the American administration um, giving constructive criticism to oppose policies that they think are disruptive. So, Yo, what do you think the next step is, I guess, going one step beyond constructive criticism um, to rein in these issues? I think, no, I think Jeffrey makes a good point, um, which is that um, the, the problem is that Israelis until now have seen boycotts as initiated by people who uh, reject Israel's right to exist. And it, what we are doing precisely is, you know, as people who do support Israel explicitly, openly, uh, as someone myself who has family and friends in Israel uh, who is Jewish, uh, who, who, was, who was raised as, 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 uh, as supporting Israel my entire life, um, to say to Israelis this is not uh, the same. Uh, these initiatives are not the same initiatives that you saw in 48 by, by Arab countries. Uh, what we're doing is completely different. What we're doing is, is telling you not, uh, you know, we're not criticizing you uh, to, to, to delegitimize you. We're not criticizing you uh, because we oppose your right to exist. We're, we're, we're criticizing you because we think that only by doing this, only by, by forcing you to, to look at yourself uh, and to start a discussion in your own country and to change these self-destructive policies. Only by doing that can you assure your own future. Jeffrey, I'm kind of asking out of curiosity, how do you or others um, who have adopted the constructive criticism approach reflect on you know, Jews like UL who may feel that that's not going far enough? Um, well, I, I mean, I understand Yoel's convictions in this. Um, I obviously disagree. Um, but I think that, I guess going back to your point, is that I don't see how you can make such a distinction in parenting them when you are boycotting their, their products or, you know, calling for, or comparing it to apartheid South Africa. That just sounds like the rhetoric used by the Arab countries to delegitimize Israel. So in order to distinguish yourself, you have to say, look, we're not going to take a oppositional approach to you. We're going to say, we as a friend, you know, we still view you as a friend. We're going to say that we understand your concerns, but we still think that you should change your policy because it's your, in your interest. And if you explain it that way, I think it comes across much better. Okay. Um, any comment? Yeah. I mean, I would just say, that's fine if it worked. It just doesn't. And it hasn't. For years and years and years, this is exactly what the United States has been doing. They've been, uh, the United States policy is we oppose settlements uh, uh, officially. And, we, and what the United States has been doing, decade after decade, president after president, is to sit down with Israelis and nicely ask them to please stop constructing settlements. Oh, sure. um, and, and, and so, since we've seen that this hasn't worked, I think anyone who's realistic needs to come down and say, okay, we need to, we need to change strategy. What we need to do is ask civil society as people, not just as governments, who are concerned for Israel's future, who are concerned about human rights violations, we need to do something more tangible. So, I guess a follow-on question to that. I think we can all agree that there are countries in the world who have human rights violations much more severe than anything that might be going on. Sure. Why pick on Israel in this case? Well, I think, as I wrote in my, in, in my op-ed, the reason why we're singling out Israel is because we care about Israel. Because we, we I, I care about Israel's uh, future more than I would care about any other random, uh, is, uh, countries future because we, I, I see Israel as an ally, because I see myself as pro-Israel. This is exactly why I, I, I single out Israel and I care about uh, talking about Israel and focusing on Israel and making sure that Israel as a country that I care about takes, uh, takes a, a different direction so that it can exist for many, many years to come as opposed to going down this uh, path that has been going for now decades which will inevitably lead to, to very bad things and, and to, to self-destruction, I think. Do you think that a pro-Israel viewpoint could ever include boycotts? I don't think so. I think, well, I think that they could... So, I mean, I think that boycotts the way that, say, PCP has now been using them are not productive. Now, I would say that, like, any... Like, I'm not opposed to boycotting things that, say, um, uh, you know, are the direct product of human rights violations. For example, um, 
a friend of mine just informed me that Hershey's chocolate was in, you know, is, a lot of it is produced by slave labor. So I'm having second thoughts about, produce, uh, about eating Hershey's chocolate. But that's because it's a direct product of human rights violations. Again, I don't think a general boycott of Israel is, a, you know, t targeting direct products of human rights violations. I think that's an overly broad approach that is just, as I said, sends Israelis the message that it's not about specifically things you do wrong, it's about being Israeli. Great. And it's as a continuation of previous boycotts. And can I ask one final question? Would you be willing, for example, to uh, then join us in a boycott of Motorola, which uh, sends weapons directly to the Israeli army, uh, and, and which are used then for human rights violations? And that's a very specific thing. It's not boycotting Israel or Israel, Israel society, it's boycotting uh, weapons that go into uh, the Israeli army, uh, for, and, and they are implicated in human rights violations. Would you be willing to do that? Because if you're not willing to boycott something so direct as, 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 as people who literally send weapons uh, that are used for human rights violations in Israel, then you're not willing to boycott Israel, uh, any, any, any Israeli company or any, any company that is associated to human rights violations in Israel. And therefore, what you're doing is, is just rejecting any, any way of pressure of Israel, which brings us, brings us back to the same policies of the last decades, which just haven't had any consequences whatsoever. I mean, I think you misunderstood my uh, conception of boycott. My conception of boycott is specifically on, um, you know, uh, where by producing the product, the, the method of production of the product result, it is through human rights violations, for example, slave labor. So for example, if Israel were enslaving Palestinians to produce more Motorola phones, then fine. But they're not doing that. And I would also disagree with your characterization of Israeli human rights violations. Obviously, we're going to disagree on that. It's a much larger debate. Um, but I, again, I, I think that the boycott issue, as you framed it, is too, way too broad. And I think it results in a picture of Israel that is just not what you would expect a treatment of an ally to look like. Great. Well, thank you both for coming. Um, I think no one on campus will view hummus the same way again. Um, and thank you for listening. Bye-bye.